happen and stop playing. Wow, that is weird. It's only five seconds. I don't know how that worked. That being said, Hockey Nation fans, it is March 24th. It's almost the end of March, and the Ides of March are upon us. I don't even know what that means. We know March Madness is in full swing, but what's mad is the play of the Detroit Red Wings is still struggles. It's amazing since, you know, they made a few moves, how they're suddenly in the tankathon. But the core of this future is pretty good. Like, and we see that with Simon Edmondson, who played his first NHL game this week and got his first NHL goal last night, which was an interesting one. Um, suddenly, good morning, run with Kings. I appreciate you joining. I haven't talked to you. Apologize for not seeing you soon. Er, good morning, Enertap, my friend. How are you doing? Keeping the hockey nation burning. Uh, well, you know, we knew this was a busy week and it was going to be kind of interesting. If not for one thing, which is they called up Simon Edmondson in place of Ben Sherratt. Good morning, RJ Calabro. Thank you for joining as well. And the good news with all of this is that we see a young Simon Edmondson. Oh, I see what happened is it didn't totally export the thing. Let's try this in the background while I do this. Um, we're seeing great things actually from this player. Oh my God. Did I navigate away? <laughs> We're seeing that Simon Edmondson is not only six foot six, but he's a, also a great skater with really, really above average offensive instincts. And he's not afraid to pinch down even to the net. And he's not afraid to engage physically. I think that's a marked improvement from his initial play that we saw in rookie camp and training camp and preseason, in which he was definitely, you know, not maybe ready for the NHL, but his learning curve appears to have been very, very quick. So here we have the future of the Red Wings, and it's looking not too bad with him. Meanwhile, they continue to tank, and maybe we'll continue to improve their prospects of you know, getting a top draft pick. So there's a lot to unpack there. It's a little bit tough as a fan right now because they're playing some competitive games in the sense that you know they're not folding. Uh, we saw an, an important injury, unfortunately, to Vili Husu, who they have rode all year long. <laughs> You know, his workload has definitely been heavy. Let's put it that way. And that heavy workload, is, it was kind of like a concern. He did have an injury last year with St. Louis. And here we see, again, he has a lower body injury. You hope that this is not, but it looks like it is a groin. So as a result, we had Magnus Helberg starting. And that didn't last very long last night. <laughs> As, and what was, what was, I guess, interesting was to see the return of our friend. I don't know what's going on with this. This is not uploading the entire file. <laughs> Let's see why. We saw the return of on Alex Nav, uh, Nadelkovic. I don't know. That's a really good question. We see Nadelkovic get his first start since um, last year, December. So I guess the first thing that's interesting is who's so out? How long will this be long? We also saw Edmondson get hurt in the prior game, but he returned last night to get his first NHL goal. So obviously it wasn't too serious, but who's so injury? You know, do they shut him down at this point? How serious is it? That remains to be seen. As a result, you get Halberg in the net. And as I said, that did not work out too great against St. Louis. You can see Detroit winning in all key areas. 30 shots on goal, 22 only for the Blues. but And it was 2-1 to one for the Red Wings. They seem to have very good first periods. This is a pattern. But then three unanswered goals in the third. And it's 4-2. to two. Heading into the third period. This was not a great night for our friend Magnus Halberg. He only stopped nine of 12 shots and was replaced by Alex Nadelkovich, who actually played pretty well, allowing one goal on uh, 
well, he didn't play that well. I guess he had one goal in eight shots. So <laughs> that's still an 89 save percentage. But he made some good saves. I thought he looked okay. And this is an okay uh, return for him. Uh, the big news I would say is two things. One, the Alex Jason call up is working out very, very well. And I wondered even during the year, I kind of forgot that he was playing in the AHL with the Griffins. Um, he had a pretty decent year. Like he's pretty consistent year to year, like a 12, 13 goal score. He's a big guy. He goes in front of the net, not a beautiful skater, but he can, he's got good hands around the net. And we saw that again last night as he gets his fifth in the last 10 games for the Red Wings. So this has been a good news story. And he almost had a sixth. I don't know how the other one didn't go in. It was kind of like a weak side gold mouth thing. And it kind of floated right along in the air across the line out of the net. And it looked like it was going to go in, but it didn't happen. So this has been a, you know, a lone bright spot. They really miss Michael Rasmussen. We know he's not going to be back this year. All of this is like showing he is, he is a very important piece to their puzzle. And hopefully when he comes back next year, that that'll continue to be the case. You hate to see him out. In the meantime, Chase on has been more than adequate replacement for Oscar Sundqvist, who was traded for a draft pick to the Minnesota Wild. Uh, so we see as a result of this, a 4-3 loss for the Red Wings at the end of the day. They did come back a little bit. Not great goaltending, which is, you know, the concern you have. There's a big, big drop-off between Billy Huso and the other two net miners. <clears throat> and, yeah, that, that was pretty much the case last night. Simon Edmondson, though, let's see if I have this. Um, his goal was kind of a weird one too, where he shot it on net. He, but you could see he's willing to pinch down. He's got really good wheels. He's got good offensive instincts. He opened up a lane that was maybe deeper than most defensemen are, you know, comfortable with. And he continued down towards the dot and it looked like it actually went in off Matt Luff, but it didn't touch anybody except Joel Hofer and then kind of curling shot it into the net. So congratulations. He got the puck, of course, of his first NHL goal. And this has been a pretty decent news story with him. Um, you can see maybe why they were comfortable in trading Philip Ronick. Philip Ronick actually made Good Morning brand new. How are you liking things with your Colorado Avalanche these days? Um, you can see why maybe the Red Wings felt comfortable in moving Philip Ronick, knowing that he was going to need a contract as a restricted free agent. He's already at $5.5 million, given his offensive production. Um, you know, he's going to get a decent contract. Now, this does not solve the right side. They've gone from being very strong on the right side to having a lot of... Yeah, I thought it bounced in off his butt. <laughs> Didn't happen, though. So I think, I think it, you know, I kind of... If I was in front of the night, I might have felt that maybe it was my goal, too. I don't know. And it was such a weird play that kind of actually hit the goalie without touching anybody else and then just trickled in between Hofer and the pipes. So it was interesting. Congratulations though to Simon Edmondson, who's been looking really, really good. He's been paired up with Moritz Sider. So you can see this is going to be a very, very high end defensive duel for a very long time. Moritz Sider and Simon Edmondson is very, very interesting. <laughs> it's like a dream pairing. Not many teams have two guys that honestly, like you could see, project where Simon Edmondson has the capability of being, as good as Moritz Sider at some point. I mean, Moritz Sider is definitely ahead of him at this point. And, you know, one's left, one's right. This could be very interesting on the power play for a long time, given both their skill sets. And we saw, like, there was one point where Simon Edmondson went right to the net, and there was, like, everybody on the Blues started pounding on him. Joel uh, Jordan Eber Osterley, not Eberle, Jordan Osterley jumped in and grabbed one of the guys that was – was throwing punches at him and started scrapping, which I think was Walker and, you know, to stick up for the rookie, but it didn't look like he needed much sticking up for. <laughs> he's not, he's not, you know, he looked like he was a little timid at the beginning of the year, but man, he's only 18 guys. This is crazy. This is a real 18. Has he turned 19 yet? He's a really, really high end talent. So those are a couple of good news stories between Alex chase on and Simon Evanson, but not much else great going on. We see without, you know, you have no Ronick. You also have no Ben Sherratt. And you look like now you have no Billy Huso. This might be a rough ending to the year. So at this point, yes, Jason's working out. Do they bring him back next year? It's unclear. I like him. I mean, I've, I've liked him in other places too. He can be an effective third-line player. 
we see Carolina still tops, but for how long? I don't know. They have 100 points on the season. They have no more Svechnikov for the rest of the year. New Jersey continues to pump along 5-3-2 and two in their last 10, 6-4-0 oh for Carolina, and the Rangers 7-2-1, and one, chomping at it, but still six points back. So we have about 10 to 12 games for most teams. Uh, we also saw the goal, the 60th goal of the season for Connor McDavid. So congratulations to him. Like kind of crazy. I think he's the first player they said in, since Mary Lemieux to get 60 goals. Is that right? Is it 27 years? Or is he the fastest to that? I don't know. The youngest to 60 goals. Maybe that's what it was. Yeah, they're going to have to. Chase Long's been really effective in front of the net. Like this is a guy that is pretty useful. Perron uh, took a lousy penalty at the end of the game last night, but kind of put a stake in uh, their attempt to kind of come back. Boston continues to kick everybody's butt. Five wins in a row. <laughs> I was just in Boston for a day. 115 points on the year, 71 games, 11 games to go, 55 wins. Does this end up at 60 wins? Speaking of 60, Toronto with 95 points, and then Tampa a little bit back with 90 and then you look at the wild card pittsburgh got a loss but they are in the first wild card spot why because florida is back to their losing ways after beating the red wings five to two earlier in the week they're they've lost i think two in a row yeah they have lost two in a row there you go washington's been doing okay but you know i don't see them clawing back into this but maybe i mean they only have they have 76 points um games in hand on the teams ahead of them Islanders are surprisingly four or three wins in a row. Four, yeah, three wins in a row, it looks like. Seven, two, and one. I was going by the top of my head, but that's incorrect. And look at the goal differential, seven plus 17. So this, you know, the, the, the Bo Horvat trade, I was a little bit skeptical of, like, why would you get him? But it seems pretty obvious that Lou Lamarillo and Lane Lambert had their finger on the pulse of that team, and this has worked out real well so far. Pittsburgh, you know, kind of yo-yoing up and down here. Um Goal differential of minus two. This has kind of been the story more recently, like four, five, and one. They need to get some consistent offense and goaltending. And despite that, they still might make the playoffs, but it's not clear. They have 80 points, only one game, one point up on Florida, but Florida is not helping themselves. They really aren't. So now we have Philadelphia Flyers coming up on Saturday, another 1 p.m. Eastern game. I think this was the same as last week was a 1 p.m. Eastern game, wasn't it? Carter Hart. Presumably against Magnus Helberg, or does Alex uh, Nadelkovic, or how you pronounce his name, I can, still can't pronounce his name, get the start? We know who it won't be. It won't be Billy Huso. That seems to be a reality. That um, goal, was that a backhand goal uh, against Colorado where he kind of came down, stick hammer over the one side and backhanded it? That was kind of crazy. So we see in the last five games, the offensive woes kind of continue, but Alex Chason, not part of that problem. You're kind of getting offense from Larkin and Chason. We're not seeing production really from guys like Perron. Kubelik, you know, kind of looks like he's in outer space a lot of times, and then he'll get some points. You're getting offense from Sider a little bit, but it's not enough here. They need secondary scoring, and that's why I say, like, they really kind of miss Michael Rasmussen. Yeah, that was a real good goal, Crosby against Colorado there. Hi, Greg John. Thank you for joining. It's nice of you to jump in. So we had a, we were just to recap, like Detroit loses to Florida 5-2. Florida since then has lost two games in a row. During this week, we saw the 60th goal of the season for Connor McDavid. Uh, we saw Chase on get his fifth goal last night, which is pretty good. And we saw the first NHL goal for Simon Edmondson. So we're just kind of picking and choosing. Yeah, that was a little wild. <laughs> no Ben Sherratt, no Philip Ronick. How did Ronick do? Let anybody watch the Vancouver game last night? I don't. I did not, but maybe we can just check in on that because he made his debut last night as a Vancouver Canuck. Ooh, they won seven to two. Is that right over Tampa? What? <laughs> this is dumb, by the way. Like, you know, Detroit did it right. They're losing at the right point where they're going to finish the year. They were well above five hundred all season. And, you know, now they're getting some injuries. Now they're missing some bodies. They made some moves and they still, they're getting the young guys more ice time. So they're going to get a higher draft pick. And what's Vancouver doing? They're suddenly crushing Tampa Bay seven to two. Maybe coach 
is right, by the way, about the struggles of the Van- of the Tampa Bay defense. So maybe this is a good matchup if the Toronto Maple Leafs get them in the first round. What do you guys think? Nicholas, thank you so much for joining. I'm a, I appreciate you being here. Yeah, there was a lot of crazy stuff. You're right. What was the craziest thing you saw run with Kings? Um, so, you know, that was kind of weird. Like, seven to two, this loss. So, you know, at some point, the King loses its crown, right? <laughs> Is this what we're seeing with Tampa? Like, they have 90 points. They look like they're in the playoffs, but you just never know. And then suddenly Vancouver, like, what are you doing? Like, suddenly Vancouver just comes in. Oh, I'm sorry. It was San Jose. I thought it was Tampa. I swear to God, if you look at it, it looked like it was Tampa. Oh, that's Ottawa won 7-2 over Tampa. Okay. See, I did not watch this game. It was I was off doing other things. Okay, this makes more sense. 7-2 to two there. Demko back in the net, still below 900 save percentage, only faced, get ready for it, 19 shots in this game. <laughs> yeah, that, that injury we talked about earlier, and it's unclear how long, but you got to think they're just going to shut him down at some point. There's no real benefit if you play him and he continues to – like he had a very heavy workload a lot of times, playing a lot of back-to-back and tough games. And he's – you know, there's a very different thing when you have Halberg and Net and Alex Nedelkovic, uh, Nel, uh, Nedelkovic, how do you pronounce it, um, got his first start since I think they said December 6th or 8th. The Leaf defense is not good enough to beat Tampa Bay. I, I tend to think you're right. Um, I don't love the way they play. Like to suddenly switch to a tougher defensive style is really, really, really difficult. So if they're not doing it in the next five, 10 games to suddenly say, okay, now we're going to play a tough playoff style game. Not likely. So that the problem is you've got a grizzled NHL championship team there in Tampa. And, you know, that's, (laughs) They can switch it on, unlike other teams. That's kind of my point. And they've got the personnel to do it and the experience. I have a hard time to believe Tampa just can flick a switch. But they've shown they can. That's the thing. They're very capable of it. However, it is concerning, right? If you're Tampa, you're a little worried, and you're trying to dial in your game the next 10, 12 games, and losing 7-2, to two, and we've seen a couple blowouts, you know, where they even sat some of their star players. So they've had a lot of miles on them, right? Like, have they been in the last three Stanley Cup finals? That's tough. Yeah, well, it's not over yet. (laughs) Vancouver is the one that's bizarre. Like, you go and you thump San Jose. Kuzmenko, by the way, what a great pickup this was. 35 goals in the year. JT Miller uh, getting his 29th. So those are all good news stories. Thomas Hurdle getting his 20th for San Jose. Pod Colson's had a really quiet year. I know he was hurt at one point. Uh, Sheldon Dree's 11 goals. That's interesting. And only 19 shots on net, though, for San Jose. So they're going to be, like, bottom two, I think, right? Is that where they end up? So they they If we look at the standings, they're down there. But Kuzmenko, what a great pickup this was. This is a guy you can definitely help build around. He is showing he can... Definitely play at a high, high end. Uh, Connor Garland only is 13th of the year. That's kind of like that signing's not looking so great. It'll be interesting to see if Rutherford keeps him in the offseason or pulls something. But you can see between Kuzmenko and uh, Peterson, and I guess JT Miller, Brock Bessner, not the greatest year, but those other three guys, real good. Philip Ronick was a plus two last night, 24 minutes. 24 minutes, guys. This is a guy you traded for draft picks. And I realize they got a, a lot. But those picks are, you know, not compared to a guy that can play top three minutes. And that's number one type minute, 24 minutes a game and a plus two. Now, it's a plus two because it was a blowout. But uh, I don't know. I kind of lament this move a little bit. You, you see why with Simon Evanson, But keeping Ronick would not have been – you know, wouldn't have affected Simon Edmondson, in my opinion. Like, your top three would have been those guys, Edmondson, Sider, and Ronick for a long time. Kind of strange to me. 
23 minutes for Quinn Hughes, 21 minutes for Tyler Myers, and 23 minutes for Ethan Bear. If you're playing Ethan Bear 23 minutes, normally that's not the greatest sign, but you can obviously get away with it against kind of a not great San Jose team. 26 minutes for uh, Eric Carlson. That's interesting. So we saw, again, Toronto thumping Florida last night. You know, that's Florida continuing on the downward swing. Getting his 34th goal of the year was number 34, Austin Matthews. A year ago, we were talking about this guy getting 60. So it's definitely off his pace, but a great year overall for Mitch Marner and honestly for the Leafs. And I think there's probably a little bit more defensive conscience to Austin Matthews, but he's never going to be a great defensive player. The guy who's had a really great year, though, is William Nylander. I mean, Nylander with 81 points in 71 games, 36 goals. He's such a high-end talent. I don't know. Honestly, maybe. I mean, it's possible, right? Um, Devin Levy is, I think, in the running for that too, right? Is he – who are the Hobie ba Baker finalists? Logan Cooley. Adam Fantilli's in there. Sean Farrell, Montreal Canadiens draft picks in there. I don't think he'll be in the top. Houston maybe, right? Another Montreal guy. So there's two guys in there. Matthew Nyes, that's interesting for Minnesota. I'm kind of surprised at that one. Uh, but Devin Levy is in there. I got to think that he's going to be top three, right? The Buffalo Sabres signed him. I've got to think that that's kind of that's kind of who I was kind of leaning towards was either Logan Cooley or Devin Levy. Maybe Houston's in there. I don't know. Kind of interesting. It's a good question. Um, Hedman is playing injured, yeah, which is not good, right? Like we saw a, a number of years ago, before they won the Stanley Cup, Hedman was injured in the playoffs, and that was not the same team. Like he powered so much of Tampa. Denver last. Does Carter Mazur get a call up to the AHL? Maybe. Oh, they lost. Sorry. Uh, maybe. Why wouldn't he? I don't know. Is he going to turn pro? I think that Steve Eisman said he was going to talk to him and – Carter Guylander, the, the the goaltender. I don't project Guylander as being an NHL goalie. I'm not sure. Or NHL, yeah, NHL goalie. Remember, maybe one day a backup. He's a seventh round pick. And then he, but he played real well, like in, you know, the NCAA championship there. Um, Carter Mazur, maybe. So the AHL would make sense if he's going to turn pro. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Maybe Houston. I kind of leaning towards Devin Levy for the Hobie Baker uh, coming up this next week are the um, 14 U, 15 U, 16 U USA national championships. So that's something to keep an eye on. I'm not sure if I will get to Plymouth, Michigan for the 14s, but I would like to uh, Shattuck of course has a crazy, crazy team. The Dallas elite stars are in there. The Pittsburgh penguins are in there. The junior, the, the Penguins elite, I think they call them. Um, and then, I don't know who else is in there. Like, obviously, the LA Junior Kings are very good. They're like fourth in the country. I think Dallas Stars are like ninth. So there's some real good teams in there. If you want to see some young guys playing hockey in the U.S. development stream, then that's who you would check out. Did Evanson play well? Yes, he played well. You know, he he is heads up. He's such a good skater. He is active offensively. He is going to be a weapon offensively. That's what's crazy. And I think we kind of saw that he was very capable of carrying the puck. And he's such a good skater. He's six foot six. And he looked like he was in outer space in training camp defensively. And I think that's why they sent him down. But he has improved. He engaged physically with in a couple of battles. And including one in front of the net, not his own net, but the other team's net in St. Louis's net. And Jordan Osterley came in and got in a fight with Walker over that. Uh, but I don't think anybody needs to stand up for Simon Edvinson in that. Like, even though he's 18, 19, has he turned 19 yet? He's like, man, I don't know. He's a really, really, really high end player. Like, this is going to be amazing for the Detroit Red Wings long term. That's why, like, I think if you kept Philip Ronick, 
figured out a way to dump Ben Sherratt, that would have been a lot smarter. But obviously they got a big haul, but why do you care? Like Philip Ronick would have just really helped this team, but now they're losing and they're going to get a better pick. So maybe that's part of his mastermind strategy. Should Detroit keep winning or losing for a better pick? I just think they're going to lose. They don't have Billy Huso. Ben Sherratt, you know, has not had the greatest year, but he is out. Um, they're playing the young guys. I think they really, really miss Michael Rasmussen. One guy is playing great is Jakob Verona. We saw him last two games. He's got the face shield on too. And he's playing great for St. Louis. What has he got? Five goals in nine games there. So, I mean, that's, you know, there, there must have been some really, really bad behavior on his part for Detroit to have walked away from him. Because you can see the talents there, the capability of scoring at the pro levels there. You know, that might really work out as long as he can keep his head on straight. He must have had, even coming back, I, I you know, I'm speculating. Um, ugh, he's a real talent. And Philip Zadina's played well. He scored again the other night. You know, he's got so much talent. He made a great pass last night at one point. There was like tape to tape. He's such a talented player. Like, I hope he starts getting offensive production, but it seems like he really needs a strong centerman. And I don't think the Red Wings have any strong center. Like, Cop is not a great centerman. He's okay. Like, they're winning faceoffs unlike the beginning of the year, but now they're losing games. Like, there's a marked difference between when Rasmussen's in and Cobb is in. So, anyways, uh, long and the short of it, I think he's going to be really great. You can see. I mean, if you like Owen Power, you tell me the distance between Owen Power and Simon Edmondson. It is very small. Owen Power is obviously like, you know, maybe he's in the running for the Calder Trophy this year. Had a very, very good year. He's six foot five, six foot six. So's this guy. He skates as well as Owen Power, and he's smart offensively. Defensively, I think Owen Power is ahead of him, but he's obviously improved in that area. So you've got to be very excited if you're a Red Wings fan. The question is, what do you do in the second pairing? Because like right now, Wallman is good, but that, again, is a left shot defenseman. Ben Sherratt, not an answer. Ole Mott is probably better as of number five. And you can see Hag's not, you know, what I thought he would hope to have been at one point. Um, he's going to be really, really good. Yeah, but they've changed the, the rules again in this, right? So, I mean, I think what you do is you do this. You run the tankathon every day. Let's run the tankathon. And let's just say... I always like running the tank of fun. All right. So right now you're seeing Detroit still kind of in the 10th spot, right? 31, 31 and nine. They drop one to 11, right? So if we want to run this five times, they drop to 11, reset it. They ain't moving up very much. They're going to pick 10th, unless something changes. They really need to get into this bottom part. They play Philadelphia, so losing to Philadelphia would be helpful. That would put Philadelphia at 68 points and Detroit at 71. I don't think they're tanking on purpose. Like Players don't do that, and you can see they're trying, but they're just short, and no Willie Huso is not spell win, you know? Um, so you got to think they're probably going to pick 10th and then we'll see what that other draft pick they got in the deal. I think it's the Islanders draft pick. I, I don't, I don't like, this is not a great draft for defensemen. Comparing it to the Simon Evanson draft, like <laughs> it's just not great. You know, like if that's your first guy and you get Ryan Backer, you're probably right. Like maybe. And would you be better to get him than any of these other guys? Like, would you rather have him than Dvorsky? Maybe. Is he an impact defenseman or is he a second pairing? And maybe that's what you're saying. But as a second pairing, how far is he? He's another Austrian, so they've seen him a lot. They have Marco Casper in the system. 
We can see, obviously, what Simon Edmondson does. And you've got William Wallander in the system. But these guys are young. Um, so, you know, he's this This says to me, just based upon what the scouting report on is on him, he's not playing in a super high-end league there. Like, you've got to think this is a second-pairing defenseman at best. So you can take him. What's your alternative? What is Dvorsky? Could be top six? I'm not sure. He's he's soft in my opinion. So it just depends. I don't I think that that would make sense. You know, there's also the Swedish defenseman, another right shot defenseman. He's smaller and got some offense, and he's kind of bounced around that spot too. So that's possible. And then you can see, so in this. They're showing a forward and a D, but it would make sense if they grabbed a couple D there and just banked on developing one of them. Um, and they've got some guys on the pipe. So I think – how long does it take this guy to get in the top four? Four years? Three years? He might be 21, 22, 23. <laughs> right? He's 18. Is he an overager? I'm not even sure. He might be an overager even. So is he an 05 or is he an 04, you know? Because there's a lot of overagers. If you look at the top picks in this draft, it's going to be only one 05 guy, which is Connor Bedard. And then the 04s are like spots two, three, and four. Carlson, Fantilli, and Michkov are all 04s. And that's what's making this draft unusually strong. And then after that, there's a drop off, right? Like you can like Brandon Yeager, you can say who you like in there, like whether it's Will Smith or whoever, but in the end, that's why this draft is strong. You've got guys that are a little bit older and they're, they missed the cutoff last year based upon being after September 15th, but there's no great defenseman here. If your number one guy is Reinbacker or the Swedish defenseman, who's got two last names, <laughs> Axel, blah, blah, whatever his last name is. What's his last name? Uh, Axel Sandine Pelica. Oh my God, last year was way better. So there's nothing like that this year, um, which is fine. But you got to, that doesn't mean they won't grab a defenseman and maybe they see something that they project. Yeah, Pel Pelica, Sandine Pelica. <laughs> Is it Prilka or Pelica? It's P E L L I K K I or A. And like, that's a Finnish last name or is it Swedish? It's both. <laughs> He's playing in Sweden, but that's both a Finnish and a Swedish national name. Or mom and dad. It's one, you know, is one parent Swedish and when the other one Finnish. That's wild if it is. And maybe that's the reason to try it out. I don't know. <laughs> you get the Sisu Stoic and then you get like the real smooth. Swede, <laughs> all in one guy. <laughs> He's not small, but again, this is not a guy that's jumping into that lineup anytime soon. So they're going to have to come up with a second pairing right shot defenseman at some point, unless you think that Ben Sherratt's that guy, and he's not a right shot defenseman. He's playing the right side when he's not hurt, and he's not had a great year. He's better as a five. That seems evident, and they've overpaid for him at this point. He can definitely maybe you know improve, but you've got to think they're thinking they need to replace what they lost in Philip Ronick, assuming they want to make a step forward next year. And we know they were aggressive in the offseason and brought in a lot of guys. And on paper, it looks like it improved them. Now they're kind of tanking for whatever, you know, for a bunch of reasons. And that's working out to them, maybe to their benefit, because they're going to get a better pick. But the reality is, I don't think, you know, unless they make a dramatic fall the last 10, 12 games, which is possible without Billy Huso. Without Michael Rasmus and Billy Huso, you're not getting offense from any secondary scoring on the team. It's really just Chase on and Larkin at this point. A little bit of contribution here and there from Perron, Raymond, Kubelik. Whenever it happens, it happens. Uh, then the reality is they, they would have to drop down to kind of that 6-7 to really get exciting, or they win the draft lottery. So that's the reality. So we're ending, we're, you know, coming up to the end of a season in the NHL in the next 10, 12 games. 
Uh, seasons are ending all around, including now, like I mentioned next week, if you check out the USA hockey, um, national championship, so you'll see 14, 15, 16 and above, but those are really the interesting ages, uh, 14 being the 2008s who will be drafting into the WHO. Hopefully we get some of them to report if we pick the right person. If I do a good job, that'd be great to have someone show up to camp at least. And, oh, is that what it is? Got it. Thanks, Nicholas. That gives us some insight. I'm going to wrap this up, guys. We're about 35 minutes in. Appreciate you guys watching. Please hit like and subscribe. I will be back on Monday, um, and we will recap how things went in the Philadelphia game, and we will look ahead to the rest of the week. How does Simon Edmondson continue to progress? Will we see some offense from Jonathan Bergen? He looked pretty good last night, by the way, and you can see the talent of Bergen and Raymond who were playing together last night. So that, that gives them hope for the future. But look at Raymond, his offensive production. He's about 38 points right now. So he's going to end up probably below last year's production unless something dramatic happens in the next 10, 11 games, but not likely. Um, but, there, you know, this, the skill's there with these guys. Simon Evans and high, high skill. Moritz Sider's loving playing with Simon Evans. And that's going to be a twin towers for a long time. Who fills out the second line long term? I don't see it being anyone in this draft. If you do go defenseman, they would have to drop significantly, get a more significant player. So we'll see if that happens. It's possible though. Like the, the cards are kind of lining up there. I mean, the Sherrod thing is painful. Mata and Wallman are reasonable contracts. Sherrod's the highest paid defenseman right now. We know that Moritz Sider has, like, I think another year after this on his entry-level deal. So they will re-up him next year at a bigger contract, and he deserves, like, $7, 8000000 I mean, you tell me who's better than him. He's going to have a great year next year. And playing with Simon Edmondson might only help that. So these other guys are bit players. They're kind of, you know, four through six. Who is the number three in this team? And it was Philip Ronick, and he anchored the second pairing. And you saw last night he has one. He comes back for in Vancouver, and he chews up twenty four minutes and is a plus two. Now it's a blowout game against not a great team in San Jose, but man, he's a good number two, number three on most teams. People are gonna really like his shot and his offensive instinct, and he can run a second power play unit, and he's good defensively. So I don't know. I would have loved to have kept him. But other than that, you can't really question too much. There was obviously salary structure there. There was the issue. But the Ben Sherratt signing is, if that's what handcuffed you, that's really disappointing. All right, guys. I will um, let you guys go. Have a wonderful weekend. We will see you on Monday morning. And check out Hockey Nation Live tonight. I assume it's Coach Within Your Tap at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And we look forward to seeing you next week and recapping how the Red Wings did.